The Magician's Beautiful Assistant by Rachel Wyatt Paul laid the dress down on the bed. He straightened the folds and spread the skirt so that it flared, and then he tucked in the waist. There were no sleeves on the, and the bodice was cut low. He stood still for a moment, listening to his wife's music. He kept trying to like it, to learn its rhythms and repetitions, but it wasn't Mozart, and it wasn't Coltrane. Darling, he called. The, st the sound stopped, and Grazia came into the bedroom and kissed him. For tomorrow, he said. It's gorgeous, she replied, looking at the pink and silver gown. I'd already planned what to wear. I bought it at Trends. Expensive? Is it quite me? She held it up against her body, and he stared. Everything is quite you, he said, amazed at his choice, his own excellent taste. He'd seen it in the window and known at once that it was right. The saleswoman had talked him into buying a silk pantsuit as well, but he'd put that away for another time. There were half a dozen garments in her closet now, chosen by him, his eye for women's clothes, a latent talent awakened by a youthful figure. You'll look ravishing. They argued early on about what she saw as extravagance, the gold bracelet, the Mark II watch. After all, there was a planet out there to save. There were people everywhere in need. He explained to her that he could afford it. It helped the economy. Money made the world go round. His first wife, ha had she heard him, would have laughed in derision. When she left, she'd called him a tightwad. But Jean wouldn't have looked good in the pink and silver gown, and, in any case, their combined income then was a fraction of what he pulled in now. The next evening, when he was getting changed, Grazia said, So tonight we're meeting the party fundraisers? Not the fundraisers, sweetheart, the donors. Right, the fat cats. We have to get to the club early. I'll be ready. And, oh God, she was. A princess only lacking a tiara, she came down the stairs and whispered to him, Why can't we stay at home and go to bed? He thought about the Great Lakes Water Treaty to suppress desire and led her to the car. The event began at seven. She stood beside him, smiling and nodding, shaking hands, receiving people to whom much had been given and from whom much was now expected. Paul, standing there like his father outside church on those Sunday mornings long ago in Smith's Falls, saying over and over to members of his flock, so good of you to come, heard men murmur to his wife, you're looking very lovely tonight. Thank you, she replied every time. It was in her to demur and say, oh, this old thing, but she refrained and he was pleased. Beside her, the other women were drab, boring, old. The herd moved on to graze at the buffet, and lap up the free wine. Then Grazia mingled like a dream, smiling and listening, saying little. She was a natural in this charged political world, his world. He tried not to watch her, not to look possessive, not to be jealous of every man who came near her. At the same time, he was nervous that she might suddenly say the few words that could destroy a deal, upset a fragile arrangement. Hank Allison, head of ABD and five-star bastard, came up to him and said, I'd like a word. Ten years ago, the guy wouldn't have given him the time of day, but now, in a tone that was all but differential, he murmured, We need to know how the Syrax bill is going. I can assure you, Paul said. We're grateful. I understand. Your wife is a great asset, Allenson went on, nudging him and giving him a complicit grin. Paul grinned back. It was going to take some pressure on Dupuy and Williams to get their votes, but he knew the magic words. By next week, it would be sewn up. He helped himself to a glass of champagne and sipped it. The expensive bubbles spelled success. He knew that they could also spell its opposite, but dismissed that word and moved back into the fray. Great that you could be here. We've got JG on side. I think I can guarantee a meeting with the PM. On Monday morning, walking in the corridor, that corridor of power where he had never thought to walk, he bumped into bumptuous Greg Gregson. A success? Your little do on Saturday? We got a lot of promises. Call them in, Paul. Pin them down. Don't let them eat bait and slip away. Keep after them. You bet, Paul replied. I'd like you to come to our cottage in the Gatineau next weekend and bring Grazia with you. It'll be a small party. It's a pretty place. A bit of color left on the, str the trees. That's it. That is absolutely it, Grazia said, slamming her bag into the trunk on Sunday evening. Paul didn't want to hear this. He turned and looked back at the so-called cottage, a six-bedroom palace on the edge of the lake. He'd enjoyed the weekend and would have liked to savor the memory of being out on the lake with three of the most important men in the country, chatting, laughing, talking football. All the guys wanted was to get me into a corner. 
But darling, and those women, one more day in that so-called cottage and I would have pushed Ginny Gregson into the lake and held her down with a paddle. They can't help it. They can't help being middle-aged, but they can help being snobby and looking at my clothes as if I'm a tart. I'm a threat. They worry that their husbands will dump them for someone young. And who could blame them? Sorry, women of the world, I didn't mean that. But darling, moreover, they don't talk about anything but politics, and I don't mean ideas. I mean who's getting what and, talk and taking what from whom. Who's up, who's down, who's worth talking to and who's not. He put his arm round her and told her she was right, but it was part of the job. Six years ago, when he'd first seen her, Grazia was a junior delegate at the party convention, and he was on the sidelines observing. The graduate student gathering material, the graduate student gathering material for a paper on the shift in political demographics. She'd responded to his tentative approach with interest, enjoying their conversation, because he could talk. He knew his history. He'd read biographies of the great political leaders. He'd wooed her with quotations from Disraeli and tales of early struggles in Upper Canada and jokes about Mackenzie King. They'd argued as friends and fought as lovers, and she was his, on his side, part of his team. He needed her. Patiently, he said, one more, sweetie, please, on the 25th, at home, just a few of the guys, only a couple of hours. I think it will be a bit of a celebration. You want me to serve drinks and let them dr look down my cleavage. And after that, we'll go out for a vacation. Europe, India, anywhere you want. Spain, she said, turning her back on him. I have a castle there. What? He said, and then smiled. She was kidding him again. But if everything went well in the next few years, maybe he would build her a castle in Spain. A small one, near a beach, footprints in the sand, sunsets, wine on the terrace, but not yet. Not yet. He let her drive and got out his cell phone to tell Allison about the result of his weekend's work. There was a light snowfall on the 25th. Paul was out early, clearing the drive. When Gracia came back from her morning class, she told him there was no need to polish it and took the broom from him. Later, he showed her the champagne that was to be served and then took her upstairs to their room. I thought you might wear this, he said. He brought out the navy blue pantsuit and the caramel colored shirt. With her dark hair and high color, it would be perfect. She would be perfect. Perhaps, she replied and kissed him. He took it as a scent. I feel like one of those paper cutout dolls that are only wearing panties and then you put different clothes on them. There are little tabs that hook over their shoulders. This is an important day for me. I know, she said. Finally, some recognition for all I've done. You deserve everything you get, darling. He went downstairs and left her to dress. Am I, he wondered, uh, but quickly dismissed the thought, treating her like a doll? He laughed to himself. She was a living, loving woman, and who knew it better than he did? The bell would ring in moments. The maid had stayed on for an extra hour to set out trays of hors d'oeuvres and to answer the door and show the guests in. Paul moved the arrangements of chrysanthemums and fall leaves to the desk and put it between the photograph of himself with the American ambassador and the group picture in which he was standing beside the exotically dressed finance minister of Nigeria. He stopped for a moment to look at the picture of John at his high school graduation and let hurt and doubt creep into his mind. His only child despised him, and what the hell had he done to deserve that? He turned to the wedding photograph, second wedding, and put it behind the others. Grazia had chosen on that day to wear a two-piece in a white and pale green pattern that she'd bought second-hand. It scarcely fitted, or as his mother said later, it fitted where it touched. His mother resented losing a daughter-in-law, and she loved. Uh, his mother resented losing a daughter-in-law she loved, in spite of the fact that the woman had walked out on her son. At any rate, she wasn't about to welcome a replacement with Grace. She still met Jean from time to time, and he knew they talked about him and his trophy wife, and probably laughed. Well, screw them all. Grazia, Grazia loved him, and he loved her. When he saw her come into the into a room, he felt like kneeling down and praying though he wasn't sure to whom. He had accepted neither his father's God nor his father's narrow expectations. Grazia's parents didn't come to the wedding. They saw him then as the destroyer of their daughter's bright future, but came round when they smelled money. Screw them too. The bell rang. The first guest arrived. It was Gregson, looking more pretentious than usual. Where's your lovely wife? It takes her a while to get ready. But worth it, eh, Paul? Paul had never thought of himself as a smirker, but he knew that the look on his face was nothing less than a smirk. He rearranged his mouth. Gregson said, I'm early because I want a word. 
Paul led the small man towards the fireplace and leaned against the mantel to steady himself. This was his moment. Gregson said, You came through, Paul, and we're grateful. The party is grateful. It was enough. They shook hands. The doorbell rang again and again. Twenty minutes later, there were seven men in the room and no sign of Grazia. Paul had to suppress his good news till the announcement was made. He spun conversation out of air. Snow didn't stick around long. Ice on the canal soon. Somebody has to talk to the committee. You watch the game Saturday? His lovely wife was taking her time, but here she was. She made an entrance wearing jeans and an old wrinkled sweater that was too tight for her. You haven't served the drinks, Paul. What are you thinking? She turned to the men and said, He's very absent-minded these days. I don't know why. Not getting enough sleep, maybe. She winked at them and went on, Champagne, everybody? You all like that? She went out without waiting for an answer. The guests, waiting for a glass of wine, a glass of anything, were not comfortable. She came back and said, Which one of you handsome gentlemen will come and give me a hand? Gregson hurried to join her. Paul couldn't leave his visitors. More minutes went by before she returned carrying a tray with tumblers on it. Gregson followed, carrying two bottles of champagne. Paul looked at the labels and muttered to Grazia, Not this, the other, not those glasses. It was too late. Gregson had popped one cork. Bush was loosening another. I didn't mean, Paul said, but couldn't bring himself to tell them that this was the cheap stuff he kept to mix with orange juice when he invited his staff to, to Sunday brunch. He tasted it. It wasn't even chilled. He could smell doubt in the room. There was Grazia waltzing round in those dreadful clothes, pouring out $12 a bottle sparkling wine with Gregson glued to her side like a Siamese twin. This was meant to be his moment, his hour, and she was behaving like the tart the other women thought she was, giving these men something to tell their wives when they got home. This is how they saw her. This was their image of his beloved, and she was fulfilling their expectations. He said, My wife has stupidly brought the wrong bottles from the kitchen. Let's have some of the real stuff, darling, and while you're out there, go and change. She's been jogging. No, I haven't, she said, not vertically and not horizontally either. He went up to her and muttered, Stop doing this, you stupid little bitch. She threw the contents of her glass into his face. He grabbed her arm and slapped her. She didn't scream or cry, but she simply pushed him so that he flopped onto an armchair like a seal. She kept on smiling and offering more champagne to his guests, guests who disappeared one by one as if they'd been made to vanish into thin air by magic. He looked round the room, but they were gone, every one, every single one. Not one man had stayed behind to reassure him that it was all right. They knew he was not an abusive husband. He didn't go around hitting women. She was young, a bit crazy. They would forgive the warm, cheap champagne. The platter of quail's eggs and caviar were untouched. The setting sun was casting shadows on the bare branches of the trees in the garden. In the middle of the lawn, his lovely wife was lighting a fire, something forbidden by the city. Then he saw that she was throwing onto the pyre thousands of dollars worth of outfits, everything he'd ever bought her. The clothes were given, giving off sparks like a bunch of firecrackers. The damp grass was beginning to catch fire. A little line of flame was creeping towards the hedge. He rushed outside for the hose. She'd got to it first and was calmly watering the ashes and the burnt lawn as if it were summer. He stamped on the random sparks and broke off a glowing branch of cedar. A jet of water hit his legs. When it was safe, uh, when there were no more orange patches anywhere, he took off his shoes and went to sit in the living room. He ate a quail's egg. Grazia brought him a mug of tea. So it's over, he said. It depends, she answered. On what, he asked, grabbing at the straw. Come on, Paul, is this the life you really want? Sucking up to people every day, weaseling around, making deals you don't even believe in? It took me a long time to get to this place, and you've ruined it, as if it was nothing, and now I'm nothing. He couldn't look at her. He could only count the people in the family who'd let him down, four not including his father. Jean had walked out of the marriage, his mother liked his ex-wife best, his son despised what he did for a living, and now Grazia had torn down the remaining structure of his life. She was still talking. He listened to the words. You gave me the impression that you had ideals, that you wanted seriously to affect policy, and you've turned into a lobbyist. I'm good at it. We do have an effect. It's important. It's what I do. What I did. He had used the past tense and saw himself an actor in an old movie reeled backwards, walking away from everything that had made his life recently good. And what am I supposed to do now? Try to understand what you were doing to me. I was. 
You were. I mean, he looked at her, trying to figure out what he'd done that was so wrong. She was staring at him as if she wanted to draw blood out of him. She shook. He shook his head because he didn't know what to say or do to make things right. And then Grazia said, Are you really too old to learn new tricks, Paul? Part 2 There were 25 young people ranged in a circle close to the small stage. The magician was in full rig, the black tail coat and top hat, even the wand. How could there be magic without a wand to tap into its mysteries? The magician bowed. The audience applauded with enthusiasm and then sat back, bored and skeptical. The rings, please, the amazing Sandro demanded. Jack, the blue satin pants rubbing against his thighs and hating the tight silver top he had to wear, smiled the necessary smile and handed over the rope. My assistant is confused this evening, the magician said, feigning anger, and then moments later made a limp piece of rope form an apparently rigid line. Slowly and with apparent effort, she brought the two ends of the rope together to form a circle. How did she do that? Easy when you know how. Jack handed her the metal rings, holding up each one to demonstrate that it was complete, no breaks. Rapidly, she put them together, separated them. It was impossible. It was magic. The kids were not impressed. Had to be a catch. She picked a stooge from the audience, a teenage boy who slouched forward, grinning at his friends as though he knew all the answers. She put three coins into his hand and made him close his fist. When he opened it, there were four, then two. The boy lost his assurance and watched closely, but she was too quick for him. There was a flicker of interest. The tricks were simple, really. A matter of smoke and mirrors, persuading people to look over there while you were doing something over here. The coins took a while, and Jack had time to look at the kids, boys and girls with sad, surly faces from a group home. They were against her, against everything, but she was good. She almost had them. It never took her long to weave a spell. One of these days he would stand behind her and point to the hand she didn't want her audience to see. But then he didn't plan to keep doing this till one of the, these days came along. If he hadn't needed the money, he would never have answered the ad in the first place. He just hoped and prayed every day that no one he knew ever saw him in this dumb outfit. Cards, Sandro hissed. He handed them to her, and she made half of the red pack turn blue. I can do that, one of the kids said. What's your name? Rick. Come over here and pick a card, Rick. He carefully chose what he thought must be the wrong one, the one that would confuse the magician. He pushed the card into the pack. A few passes, and she pulled out the right one. He demanded to see the pack. It must be all queens of hearts. She showed him the normal set. Four suits, every card different. Huh, was all the kids said. Whose idea was it to entertain these delinquents anyway? They should have been outside kicking a football, kicking goalposts, kicking at the adults who'd sent them here. They were sniggering at Jack in his blue outfit, and he could guess the names they were muttering to each other. Their keeper came in and thanked Sandro and conjured up slight applause. The kids shuffled out as though released from chemistry class. That could have been me, Jack thought, if I hadn't had parents, if I'd gone in for stealing or bashing heads. Your place or mine, Barbara asked on the way back to town. I need a drink. There was hostility there. Your place, Jack replied. He couldn't see taking her home and introducing her to his dad, her in that get-up and him in his satin pants and having to explain the job to him. It diverted them for an hour anyway. Not happy, kids. Her place was a three-room apartment with a view of the canal. The shelves were stacked with books. More books were piled on the floor and magazines covered small tables. An exotic kind of smell clung to the shabby furniture. Ropes and scarves and fake flowers lay around in corners and masks. Masks from Africa, from the West Coast, from Italy, some of them creepy. The large desk in the corner with its neat stacks of files and papers was where she did her real work, a different kind of juggling. She changed out of her suit and put on a white gown with a cabalistic design. I slipped up on the double card, she said, almost didn't get it out of the pack in time. She began to throw a loop of rope into the air, trying to make it land over his beer bottle. I'm going to try the new scarf thing on Monday. If it doesn't work, I'll make it into a joke. 
What I need, Jack, is for you to look sexier than ever. Do an Elvis. Push it out a bit. I'm not suggesting thrust. Just, you know. And while they're staring at your equipment, I'll do the, the switch. She picked up a pack of cards and ran them from one hand to another as if she was pouring liquid between jugs. You'll be wanting me to strip next. It's a women's group. Might be a thought. And let them tuck money in my pants. Fifty-fifty. Dream on, he said. She picked up her wand and tapped him with it. Disappear, she commanded. He lurked on the street for a while and watched till the older man arrived and went into her building. He wondered if the amazing Sandro performed her rope trick for him. At the club that evening, the same old guy came in but didn't notice Jack in his bartender's role. He asked for a scotch, single malt neat. A connoisseur or a phony? Hard to tell which. Nice suit, possibly rich. Did Barbara sleep with him? He'd come to watch the show a couple of times, but she had never introduced them to each other. Between serving drinks, Jack got out his notebook and jotted down the lines he overheard and descriptions of the people. Grist for his mill. If a guy in a ski mask would only come through the door and shoot the place up, he'd be a first-class witness. The police would find him reliable, observant. And what do you do, sir? I'm the magician's beautiful assistant. On Sunday morning, his mother was watching for him out the window. She was looking her elegant best and had brushed her hair back, no longer trying to hide the lines on her face. She was good with makeup. He could smell beef roasting. There would be Yorkshire pudding. He would put on five pounds in an hour and the satin pants would be tighter than ever. There was a picture of your father in the paper, she said, leading him to the kitchen. He doesn't look happy when I think. He wished she wouldn't think. Not about that. It had been ten years, or was it twelve already, and five years ago, when his dad had remarried, she'd stirred up the resentment of the divorce and just kept on picking the scabs off old sores. He offered to stir the gravy. She slid the roasting pan out of the oven, and there it was, the slab of meat with all the vegetables greasily nestled around it. How's your work, she asked. He'd forgotten to invent the usual tales on his way here, so he said, nothing much new. Your father could get you a job as an intern, all those MPs he knows now. I like what I do, he said. I like the guys I work with. But is there any future in it? Only if I become incredibly dextrous. She brought out an apple pie. He asked for a very small piece. Mom, he said. She was all attention at once, as if he were still ten years old and about to tell her he couldn't go to school because he had, because he had a stomachache. In fact, I'm working for a lawyer. That's wonderful. You're go, you'll go back to school and... She's mainly, mainly pro bono. Has another job on the side. I never heard of a lawyer having a job on the side. What does she do? He couldn't, could not bring himself to tell because that would reveal his part in it. So he said, she gives talks to people. A speaker. She must be clever. Stick with her. How old is she? Is she nice looking? My son is married to a lawyer. He left her to her fantasy and went to tidy the kitchen and put the garbage out, wondering how soon he could leave and get back to the piece he was writing on the politics of style. He made coffee and took the mugs into the living room. His mother was sitting in her Madonna pose as if she'd dined on a light salad and a glass of water and was floating above the chair. I've taken up music again, she said. My teacher's a fantastic man. He says I could have. His mother had stopped finishing her sentences a long time ago. At any rate, I can retire next year and then I can devote more time. He looked round the tiny apartment. Hardly room for a piano. She could have afforded more space, but this was the home she moved to after she left him and his dad and she remained in it as a reproach. To herself or to them? Nervous breakdown, she'd said at the time, but it was something else, something he could now almost begin to understand. He wanted to walk away himself to go to university on the West Coast, but working at two jobs and selling articles at three cents a word to a free weekly journal wasn't going to get him out there anytime soon. As if she could read his thoughts, his mother said, you haven't asked. There was no way he was going to ask again after the last time. Dad's scathing remarks about writing stuff for idiots and his reply that it was better than pandering had led to a major rift. If Barbara was a real magician instead of a two-bit conjurer, she would be able to turn straw into gold. How big was the step from magic to miracle? Both required great faith, alas. 
This is a neat event, she said as they were driving to the venue next evening. If they like us, they'll tell their friends and they'll tell their friends. And these people have friends, let me tell you. You'll have to get someone else soon, he said. I'm getting more pieces in the magazine. And they pay what? My dad has money. And you're not speaking to him. She was nearly old enough to be his mother, but he wasn't going to let her tell him what to do. One night, after a long show in Kanata, they'd drunk a good deal of beer and he'd almost, almost made a move on her. He could tell she wanted him, but he'd got up and left while he could. Never sure now whether he should or shouldn't have, but glad that he hadn't. She was attractive in a heavy kind of way, round body, great breasts, but again, she was 36 to his 20. The women's book club had decided that an hour of magic would be their treat, a few tricks for Halloween. It was a grand house. The living room had to be 20 feet long and nearly as wide. The pictures on the wall, the candle holders, the little figurines were expensive and looked genuine. If Barb could conjure some of this into their box, it would be worth a few bucks. The women, various ages, various sizes, various outfits, all kinds of chic, were drinking wine and eager to be drawn into the mystery. One in particular, a young one, somebody's daughter maybe, stood up and introduced them. The amazing Sandro and her lovely assistant. He bowed and they laughed. They laughed as though they'd already had a good bit to drink. Barbara, serious in her tailcoat and black hat, began her spiel. She had a different line from other conjurers. She made it sound poetic as though if they only believed, only watched, their lives would be changed. She could take them to another sphere. Follow me, people. She'd brought tricks suitable for the occasion. First she asked Jack to go round the audience and borrow a scarf, a watch, a ring. The woman who offered the ring held onto his hand and asked him to make sure she gave it back to him. There was a little low laughter. Barb tucked a small handkerchief into the hollow of her left hand and in the next moment pulled out a never-ending string, string of black and orange streamers. How did she do it? The watch was put into a blender and made into a milky liquid, which Jack drank slowly, pretending to choke as he spat out bits of metal. A flower was pulled out of the scarf, and another and another, and in one of the blooms was the watch. The, appla the applause got louder. Wine was being handed round again, and Barb offered to turn it into water. The woman he'd taken the ring from was amazed to find it in her glass. And now the magician said, Will someone please dim the lights? My assistant will give those of you in front a rope to hold. Hold on to it tightly. One or two of them touched him as he walked by, patting his butt. He refrained from swinging his hand back and whapping them on the jaw. They were dazzled as Barb made a pattern in the air with lights and spelled out the name of their hostess. Those holding the rope discovered a flower in their hands when Jack took the rope away, and it was over. The applause went on, and much of it seemed to be directed at him. Afterwards, a, a woman hung around them, watching as they packed up and folded the box of tricks, everything in its right place. Jack glanced at her, wondering why she wasn't going into the dining room with the others to eat. She glanced back, stared, in fact. He sensed that Barbara was looking at him, too. It was a triangle. He was being offered a choice. He knew where the money was. Barbara gave him $25 a performance. The woman, the stranger, and those who came after her would pay much more. He could, go, he could be back at school in six months, worn out, a husk, a man who had given pleasure to many. He smiled as he thought of the boasting he could do to Jerry and Andy, the envy on their faces, simulated envy maybe. After that, a best-selling book entitled The Life of a Young Goat. They weren't invited to stay and eat. As she pulled up at Pizza Heaven, Barbara said, You were a hit with th that little crowd. And we've got three gigs in November, and December is crazy. Why do you do it? he asked, as if he didn't know. It was a skill she had, something she was good at, a talent not to be wasted. She loved to mystify people. In fact, Jack, I'm truly thinking of starting to do it full time. I have to work up a couple of original tricks. We need an agent, a few TV appearances, and we'll have a show of our own. He held onto the pizza box, and when they got to her place, she invited him to come up in a way that suggested more than the shared meal. She was offering him an eternity of magic. His young life dribbled away in rings and ropes and cards and colored scarves and sex with randy middle-aged women. He saw himself at 40 in a much larger blue satin suit, handing the rings and the rope 
to an arthritic Sandra. Before Barbara could snap her fingers and utter any magic words, he hopped out of the car and ran. He'd gone several blocks before he realized that he'd left his tracksuit in her car and was still holding the pizza. Sitting down on a low wall, he ate several slices. He hoped that the passers-by who waved at him took him for a party-goer or a member of the ballet. What he was, in fact, was a prodigal son about to go home and apologize to his father. He opened the front door quietly so that he could run upstairs and change before he was seen. But there was a ghost in the living room, the shape of a head against a chair back. The old man was sitting in the dark and didn't even say anything when he put the light on. There was a, small, a, there was a strong smell of ash and of despair. So the lovely Grazia had gone, taken the money and rushed off to find someone new and young. He felt sorry for his father and regretted calling him a pander. Dad, he said, no answer. You okay? Still no reply. Not only was his father, the prominent lobbyist and party hack, speechless, his suit looked as though he'd slept in it. Had Grazia decamped with absolutely everything, even his clothes? I'm fine, his dad said, not sounding fine, but turning round. What in the world are you wearing? You're a what? he asked, after Jack's explanation. Music was coming from the kitchen and a smell of simmering pasta. Grazia was there, singing along to some operatic love song. You're still here, Jack said. What have you done to him? You know how butterflies change into caterpillars or the other way around? At any rate, they morph. Your dad's morphing. It'll hurt for a while, but he'll be beautiful when he's got through it. You don't need to worry about him. When he was leaving to meet his friends downtown, Jack patted his dad on the shoulder and gave him a little kiss on the cheek and said, everything will be all right. He was not sure what everything was, or whether it would be all right, but in years past, in bad times, it was what the old man had said to him. Part 3 Jack had called to say he was coming over to say goodbye later. Barbara was sorry to lose the kid, but he really hadn't the soul for it. Didn't understand the thrill of surprising people, hearing them gasp with wonder at illusions that were as simple as one, two, three, once you had the knack of distraction. On the one hand, and on the other. If he'd been keen, she could have taught him a trick or two. Meanwhile, the amazing Sandro had to find another assistant. But right now, Ms. Grant, the lawyer, was in charge and could expect no gasps of amazement in this role and certainly no standing ovation. The case, as usual, came down to money versus poverty. Their first lawyer had backed out, leaving a couple with, it seemed, no hope of ever getting out of a debt trap. They were waiting for her in the dreary corridor of the courthouse. Their eyes beseeched her. If they'd been wimp the whimpering kind, they would have whimpered. But their problem had obviously given these two a kind of stoicism that was beyond reason. They should have been shouting out against fate, against the system, against the landlord who had driven them to this. Why weren't they kicking against the pricks? She'd read the file and it looked hopeless, but she was a magician. Confidence was all. We'll win, she said. We have to, Miss Grant. Sharon Hagel was a small woman with red hair nicely cut. Her heavy winter jacket was too big for her, as if she'd shrunk within it. Her husband Mike was wearing a well-pressed dark suit and carrying his coat. She would have liked to set them on a magic carpet and fly them to a warm place, an island where soft music played and kindly people brought them food and drink. We will, she assured them, and realized that she had just imagined them in a kind of heaven. For all their struggles, these two weren't ready to die. Mike had been standing back and now he came forward and spoke. It's like a lot of spoiled kids are playing with us like toys, tossing us around one to the other for their own amusement. Obviously, as a child, he'd read tales from the old myths, stories of heroes whose fortunes were dictated by irresponsible gods. It's another day of work, Sharon said practically. It's not so much that. We're told, be here on such and sh such, and such a day. She loses a day's earnings and I miss another interview, and what's it to them? Neither of them was a candidate for the only job Barbara had to offer, and neither of them was going to be impressive in court. It would take some fancy footwork to win this one. An official came to announce that there was a delay due to illness. Come back on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. You see, Mike said, our time isn't worth spit. Let's have coffee, Barbara suggested, and took them to the cafeteria in the basement. They should have been going over the facts, but here was an audience, and the amazing Sandra couldn't help herself. 
She took sugar packets from the little bowl on the table and made them disappear, and then found them in Sharon's hair, Mike's pocket. Sharon smiled at her as if she were a clever child showing off. Mike looked at her with suspicion. You're a conjurer, he said. It's my hobby. And you can't do anything about stopping the bastard? She led them to the talk about themselves. Fifteen years ago, Mike had been well on the way to being a hero himself. High school football had led to tryouts, a scholarship, an accident. Since then, a variety of jobs below his level. Sharon was taking computer classes at night and working in a deli during the day. When she was earning more, he planned to go back to school. Let's talk about your chances. Your ex-landlord is suing you for back rent and damages. You say, I know, I know, I believe you. The damage was not your fault, but occurred because he failed to do repairs, and you gave fair notice. So why is he doing this? Why does he persist? That's what, I, what we want to know. Because he can't stand to lose. Because he's vengeful. Because, Sharon said and stopped. Mike shouted, because she went to see him in his office. He made a move on her, and she need him in the balls. People turned. Three women at a nearby table applauded. Without admitting her conflict of interest, Barbara said she would see them next week, wishing, wishing that she could sort out their lives and wishing she'd never met the man who was giving them all this grief. Plush chairs, a good rug on the floor, expensive wood, fresh flowers. So this was where he worked. The receptionist asked for her name. Sandro, she said. Just tell him Sandro is here. Larry Brown was the name he went by. She wouldn't have been surprised if he'd had others. He came out of his room, grinned when he saw her, and went to embrace her. She pushed him back, and he led her into his office. Why are you doing this, she demanded. What exactly? Persecuting two desperate people. She mentioned their, their names. He shrugged. I shouldn't be talking to you, she said. It's against all the rules, but you're someone I know. Is it only money with you? Is that all it is, ever? I have a business to run. I'm not hounding those people. It's my manager. Look, they don't pay the rent. They don't tell me when water is leaking from the toilet. The heating is off and the pipes freeze and they try to fix it themselves. Where have they lived before this? Under a bridge? They are afraid. You and your satraps have made them afraid. Satraps? Nice word, Sandro. When do you have another show on? I love watching you make things disappear. I never asked exactly what you do, what you did. I had my suspicions. And now you know. I grind the faces of, of the poor, whatever that means. I drive widows and orphans out into the snow every Christmas day. Or I would, but there's a law against it, so I have to wait till January. Please, just drop the whole case. Oh, right. And have all the indigents in the city move into my buildings and wreck them? Thanks for the advice. Then I hope, I hope, that one day you'll feel afraid and desperate and don't come round to my place for a drink anymore, okay? You'll get over it. See you Saturday at the Willards. <coughs> she looked at the papers on his desk, some of them no doubt about the case, and wished she knew how to effect spontaneous combustion. Then she looked at him. He was tall, sharp-featured, beaky. It was his sense of power that had attracted her, and she wasn't proud of that. Fortunately, their relationship was still spelled with a small R and was about to end with a large D. She went out without saying anything. He called after her, I'll tell the judge you are here, and laughed. Jack brought her his uniform, the blue satin pants and sequin top, and told her again that he was through. Keep it, she said. You never know. If my next assistant's a woman, it won't fit anyway. No, he said, putting the package down as if it carried an infection. She laughed and said, once a beautiful assistant, always a beautiful assistant. And by the way, there's one little thing you might do for me. He was wary as if he, managed, as if he imagined she could turn him back into a frog. All I want you to do, she said, is pretend you're a thief. And if I get caught by a pretend cop? Just a matter of a few papers. No. Well, good luck, Jack. I'm off to UBC. My dad's paying my fees. I'm worried about him. He's beginning to look happy the way people do when they go totally out of their minds. Aha, Barbara said. Someone's cast a spell on him. Was there a smell of smoke and su or sulfur? Smoke. Hey, you make everything into a trick. You were a great assistant. Thanks, I'll put it on my resume. He kissed her on the cheek and said, I had a good time, really, Barb. You'll find someone else. 
I'll watch for you on TV and in the papers, she said. Unlike her, he would stick to his chosen career and become good at it. Her parents had been thrilled when she told them she wanted to study law. They'd helped with the fees and encouraged her through the long, dusty years. But it was the magic set they'd given her to keep her quiet on that long trip through the Rockies when she was 10 that had started her on the road to mystification. Could she now sue her parents because her life was divided into two uneven parts and she wasn't sure which path to take? If she were truly interested in her career, she would put her tricks back in the box and concentrate on law, or she could sell the books and become a full-time enchanter. She spent hours looking over the Hegel files, reading up on similar cases. There had to be something, had to be, and there were only three days to go. If she argued that Larry had a history of harassing tenants, his lawyer would claim that Mr. Brown was a philanthropist who rented apartments to low-income earners and suffered great loss thereby. He was a good man who had no choice but now and then to make an example of bad tenants. There was photographic evidence of the damage done when Mike had tried to thaw the frozen pipes with a hairdryer. The theme of the Willard's party was the supernatural, a wide range. Two hours to go and she had no costume planned. If she wore her Sandro outfit, they'd expect a performance. There would be several ghosts and aliens and it was much too late to find something original. She bent a wire coat hanger to make a halo, but couldn't fix it onto her head. In the end, for want of anything better, she made a scythe out of a broom handle and a piece of stiff board covered with foil, put on her black robe, and took with her the white mask she'd bought in Venice. She had to park two streets away from the house, so she locked up the car, put on the mask, and took hold of the scythe and the wine she'd brought along, and began to walk quickly. It was cold, beginning to snow, and she didn't want the scythe to come apart. <coughs> A man in front of her turned back and saw her and then began to walk faster as if she were pursuing him. It's all right, she called out, but he only hurried on and then stopped and leaned against the wall. It was a trick. He would wait for her and then attack her. She surely didn't look like a woman in this outfit, but she walked like one, and that was enough for some of those guys. She slowed down. To get to the Willards, she had to pass him. She put the scythe in the ne hand nearest the wall so that she could hit him with it if he, be if he made a move. But he turned his back to her and appeared to be re breathing heavily. She waved the scythe at him and said, I know all about you, and walked on. Larry was dressed as Julius Caesar, handsome in his toga and laurel crown. He said he'd misread the message and thought it was about supermen. Or if you want, super persons, he said to Barbara. You look grotesque. That's what it's about, she answered. Beware the Ides of March. It's October. It's a concept. She kept away from him and danced with a Martian and then with a man wearing shorts and a t-shirt who said he was a heavenly body. All the while, she pictured the Hegels sitting in their apartment, worried about the case and wondering if their lives could get any worse. She should go home and make notes, more notes, think her way through till she found an answer instead of drinking wine and prancing around like an idiot. Tina Willard turned the music down and shouted that it was time to, pre to present the prizes. The first prize went to a werewolf, and then Tina said, and the second prize goes to our favorite conjurer. We want a trick, someone called out. A trick, Tina repeated. Here it was, time to sing for, su for her supper. But there were 30 or so people in the room, all of them friendly. How could she resist? I haven't got my wand with me or my case, she said. The assorted characters in the room were looking at her, demanding not to be disappointed. She was a magician. She could produce things from thin air. Give me a few minutes, she begged. She asked Tina for some blank sheets of paper and wrote a few words on the top one. On the top one. I need an assistant. She pointed her scythe at Larry. Reluctantly, he came forward. The magic, she said, will only work if it's performed by the pure in heart. There was low laughter from the guests. Larry was standing beside her, murmuring, get on with it. This is a lawyer's trick, she said. On this paper, I've written a few prophetic words about a case that might appear in court very soon. She put the paper into the pocket of her gown. A scarf, please. She was given a silky blue shawl, which she folded and tied round Larry's face. She turned him round three times and, and tapped him on the head with the blade of her scythe. In and out and round about, she intoned, elves and goblins are abroad. If you've been evil, they'll find out. When it comes to magic, everyone is a child. She took the scarf away, pulled the paper from her pocket, and waved it in front of Larry's face. He read the words and angrily tore the paper into strips, as she had hoped. 
she waved her scythe over the pieces and they became a whole sheet. Let's read the charges. Larry grabbed the paper and shredded it again. The audience was delighted. Barbara made, the pap made paper whole. They went through it one more time with Larry getting angrier and the guests seeing it as a prepared act. Finally, she picked a flower from Tina's hair and money from a monster's ear and bowed to cheers and laughter and demands for an encore. She shook her head. She'd done what she wanted to do. When the music began again, Larry asked her to dance. All right, he said. You're dancing with death. I hardly touched that woman. Which one, she asked. On Monday morning, she got up early. She had to be prepared because there was no telling which way the cat would jump. She walked about, practicing her speech, trying to strike the right tone. The sound of the buzzer star startled her. Who is it, she asked through the microphone on the wall. It was them, her clients. What was she to tell them? That she was useless and they would lose and become a totally bankrupt homeless couple? Would she then feel obliged to give them shelter and food for the rest of all their three lives? You'll never be a great lawyer, Professor Harding had told her in her last year at law school. A decent one, maybe. She'd gone away determined to prove him wrong. But she was only a mediocre lawyer and a fairly good conjurer. And why had the Hagels come to her apartment? She must have given them the wrong card. She invited them to come up and unlock the door to let them in. They entered laughing. Larry Brown had instructed his lawyers to withdraw the case. Had she not heard? Are you sure? She asked. I haven't been informed. She fetched her cell phone from the bedroom and listened to the messages. There it was. Game over. Charges dropped. Sharon kissed her. Mike felt in his pocket and brought out a small box wrapped in shiny paper. For you, he said. We don't know what you did, but it worked. She tore off the wrapping and there inside the old velvet bo box was a brooch shaped like an angel. It's beautiful. From the old country, Sharon said. His grandmother brought it with her. You truly are a magician, Mike said. Barbara looked at the two of them. The relief in their faces was lovely to behold and somehow much more gratifying than applause. Good luck, she said, as she, show as she showed them out. They would need it in their struggles against the world and the mythic gods. Time went slack. She had a free day. She had choice. It was cold, but the sun was shining. She went for a walk along the canal and ended up at the office. There were papers to read, new cases, more messed up lives. She left at lunchtime and went to the art gallery to find perspective. Larry called the following week and asked to see her. One last time won't hurt, she thought. She would not gloat. She'd ma made a guess, backed up by slight verbal evidence, and it had paid off. That was all. He came up to her apartment, not looking pleased. You've tidied up, he said. Thanks. My lawyer was furious about the Hagels. Good. I suppose you think you're clever, you and your lawyer's trick. It was taking advantage. That's rich. Are you going to take it up full time? Being clever? Stop fencing with me. You know what I mean. There's more than one kind of sorcery. It's hard, though, to get a really good assistant. But you are great. Thank you. The Magician's Beautiful Assistant by Rachel Wyatt